let's get into it. First things first, Rick, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much, Robin. How are you? I'm not too bad at all. Uh, not too bad at all. Now, you have a new album coming out, uh, which is very interesting because, uh, well, the thing I wanted to start with is it's it's kind of like an anniversary year next year, right? The, the band's been mm -hmm. together for 30 years and one of the approaches to the album was was kind of a, a, a trip back to the roots of, of uh, the band, of you personally, musically. Um, when you think about your younger self, what was the thing that kind of ignited that passion in music for you? Well, it actually goes a little bit further back uh, than 30 years. So we we formed Shed 7 in 1990. Uh, the 30th anniversary in 24 is, is when we released our debut album, sure. Shed in 94. But me and Paul, uh, the guitarist Paul, we met when we were about 11 years old mm -hmm. uh, and we bonded over a love of music at that age. Uh, and when we were about 13, we thought, well, we love music that much. Why don't we give it a go? So when we were talking about kind of reminiscing about bands that we grew up with we're actually talking when we were about 14 15 years old okay. uh, so I've got memories of dancing around my family kitchen with Paul uh, dancing along to Frankie Goes to Hollywood pretending we were in the band uh, we used to love listening to Duran Duran Paul was always a really big Simple Minds fan but I favoured you two a little bit more so we used to have great arguments about which was the better band out of those two which, <laughs> which a lot of people did at that time I guess so, yeah, so I think subconsciously, when we started writing this new album, me and Paul kind of, we were thinking a lot about us growing up and what we were, what we were listening to. You know, me and Paul would, you know, we've still probably got cassettes in our lots of the songs that we were writing when we were 14, you know. And, and they were kind of starting points for where we are now, really. I mean, obviously, they wouldn't be the greatest things that everyone, anyone had, could ever hear, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, I remember being in his bedroom when we'd be designing record covers for the okay. songs that we'd get to write. You know, we, we were that anal about it, we were that into it. So it was quite, you know, when me and Paul sit down and write stuff, we don't really discuss it too much. He'll just throw a guitar idea at me and I'll put a melody on it and we take it from there. But I do think with this particular album, you can hear early influences of us coming out in it. I mean, it's not obvious, but for us, we can really hear those kind of, you know, those bands coming out in it. And it, and mm. I think because of that, it sounds really joyous, you know, um, we're 50 we're in our 50s now and, and we sound like we're 22 which is for me is quite exciting I mean I feel about 28 <laughs> I'm, I'm 50 I feel about 28 and it sounds like we're 22 <laughs> well but it's that's the first thing that struck me when I listened to this album is the energy of it and kind of the exuberance almost a certain joy to be able to make music is that fair to say yeah I, I would totally agree with that I think you know with age comes experience. Um, we are lucky enough that we have been doing this coming up to 30 years professionally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the music industry is a very fickle business, you know, sure. and you can, it, certainly in this day and age, you can say the wrong word now and get cancelled wherever you are in life. So, you know, I think we feel a certain amount of positivity that we're still here i mean i would mention the word look but we are very mm. good at what we do so you know but and you put the, the effort in well yeah exactly that but then but then we are lucky that we are still we still have the opportunity to be able to do what we love doing after so many years you know like like any any band from the past you have your ups and downs if you're going to be together this long you have your ups and downs but i think we've got to the age now where we can we can discuss our differences without without it crashing and burning. You know, when you're in your mid to late twenties and your ego is huge, you just kind of you know I'm right, you're wrong, and then yeah. and then things go awry. But I think yeah, we've kind of passed that point now, which is a great thing, and I think that comes across in what we've what we've written and how we've gone about recording it. You know, we we went to Spain to record it um, for three weeks. And we were stuck halfway up a mountain with one vehicle that youth, the producer, owned. So we had no 
you know, we were trapped basically, mm. which which is a great thing because there was no distractions, there was no nightclubs to go to, there was no bars to go and sit in. So we, we basically Monday to Friday for three weeks recorded fifteen songs. So it was a song a day basically. Okay, and you you know you can almost hear the live the liveness of it. You know, I mean, we were playing together live to get the drum track sorted. But pot- potentially, a lot of it could have just all been recorded as a band because it just sounded like we were just hundred percent just into it, and mm-hmm. I, and I do think that comes through, and it's it's very exciting. What what I find interesting, and I've been talking to a, a number of bands who had kind of uh, a period of hiatus and uh, had a first stint of the band and a hiatus, and then a second one. Uh, the OMD springs to mind. I, I spoke to them not too long ago. And how, how do you experience the second stint of the band? As you mentioned, uh, you're not that 20-year-old uh, anymore. Uh, yeah. Is, is it more enjoyable now? Because I also remember, as you mentioned, the music business is fickle. And then in, in the early days of, of the music, it felt like there was more pressure on it to re- keep releasing every one or two years. And now there's there's a little bit more of a breathing room uh yeah, I imagine. To- yeah totally that i think you've hit the nail on the head there i think nowadays we decide what we do and it's it's that simple we we decide how often we do stuff and how much how much we put into it um in the sense of band duties so to speak sure. in the 90s when we first started getting popular in the 90s yeah, you're right. I mean, I get asked a lot about Britpop and what it was like in the 90s. And to be fair, at the time, we were so caught up doing it that we didn't really have any opportunity to stop and really think about what was happening mm. to us, really. You know, I mean, obviously, there were great times. But, you know, you'd release something and then you were told, right, you've got to go to Spain, you know, and then you've got to go and do that. And where's that B-side that you promised us? So it was, it, you know a brilliant situation to be in but also it was our job so it became norm you know we'd we'd go on television programs and stuff and you'd never have the opportunity to stop and just go oh god that's just happened to us so i guess it was only when we kind of reformed we had like a four-year break and the only reason we did decide to reform in 2007 was because we just missed playing live together that you know Mm. When you're 13, 14 and you're picking up a guitar and learning to play, it's because you want to get on a stage and show off to people, you know. And we missed showing off. So the the, the great thing we had in 2007 is we had a, a body of music we could dip into and go out and perform in front of people. And, you know, 2007 was such a long time after Britpop that we had no idea you know that there'd be any interest or anything so we were we were very pleasantly surprised when we put some tickets on sale i think we booked about four concerts to do and we ended up doing about 13 14 we Mm. had to upgrade the venues and there was just a sea of people coming to see us who were singing every word of these songs that we'd written in the 90s and i think it was only at that point that i actually thought oh wow what we did in the 90s actually meant something to people because 10, 15 years later, they're all singing every word back to me. Mm. So that was a really, that was a really positive step for us to be where we, where we are now, you know. I mean, for a long time, we were falling into the trap of becoming a nostalgia band because all we were doing was getting together every other year and playing our old songs. And, you know, we enjoyed it, the crowd enjoyed it, but very, very slowly, people started saying, will you ever write anything new? Sure. And for a long for a long time, it was, oh, no, you know, we do this and we, we've got other things that we do with our lives. But then we accidentally started to write some new songs. It was a total accident. I think we were in a rehearsal room um, getting match fit for a particular concert, and I think Paul came up with a guitar riff, uh, and I'm saying to him, what's that? And he's saying, I don't know, I'm just mucking about. And I'm, I'm instantly on my hands and knees scribbling lyrics and it was like we were 13, 14 again. That particular song became a song called Nothing to Live Down that was off our last album, off, off Instant Pleasures. And, you know, we started showing these little sketches that we were writing to our friends and family, and they're all going, well, this is amazing. You need to carry on doing this. You know, other people need to hear it. So that's that's what became the Instant Pleasures album in 2017. 
But I think we've kind of upped the ante again with this album. So the pressure's off in the regard that we've we've had the comeback album. This is just now an album. So the pressure's off. Uh, and and weirdly, our best selling, biggest known album was written uh, and released in 1996. It's called The Maximum High. And it was a very positive sounding album. And I think this sits really well alongside that. Yeah. It took about the, it took about the same amount of time to write it, which was literally about nine months, which is unheard of for us. Usually these things take ages. I think me and Paul got onto a real good purple patch uh, in the year 2022, where we just kind of hammered it. Uh, and it was really exciting because the ideas were flowing. Everything seemed to work. Um, it's very rare that the tap doesn't turn off you know mm-hmm. you can you can you can get into a flow and then suddenly all ideas are just gone you know i always envisage it like grasping in the air and just getting something and think oh, thanks i'll have that and i'll 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 tell the world about that you know so weirdly with this particular album everything just seems to be coming together uh and certainly in the uk i think we are a bigger band now than we've ever been which is okay. bizarre it's taken us 30 years to get there. I mean, I mean, I mean, come on, God loves a trier. <laughs> but the, 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 uh, to me, that's that's the the yeah, that's that's the amazing thing about music. You, you never know when uh, it's going to resonate with people, how it's going to yeah. resonate with people, and all that. The, 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 there's still a lot of magic and mystery, I suppose, in music. But I have, I have one more question about the, this this kind of period. Because you mentioned uh, you miss being a show off and being on stage and and kind of uh, performing live, did you also miss the creative aspect of it to to make something out of nothing to put thoughts onto paper to kind of express those feelings and and thoughts? Yeah, well, for for a period of time, not not as much as as the beginning and now, um, simply because as I said, you know, we were, we were we were going out and and we were being satiated by a crowd. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, I've I've always and I always will <clears throat> think about melodies and and think about lyrics in the sense that I could be sat I could be sat somewhere anywhere and hear I could be sat in a park and hear an old couple having a conversation and I'll pick up on certain things they're saying. And I think well, that could be, work well in a song, and I'll jot it down. I used to carry notepads around with okay. me and pens everywhere, um, and now it's a lot easier with this technology. I can just mm-hmm. take my phone and type things into my notes on my phone. But I'm always doing that, and I probably did that all the way through the down period of Shed Seven. So, you know, the ideas are always there. It was just getting to the point where we wanted to kind of start setting that in motion. Uh, and yeah, there was a, p- a period of about six years where we were kind of happy just playing our old stuff. I mean, we are a very lucky band because we've had a lot of hits in the UK. Mm. Um, so writing a set list for us is always a big problem because what do you not play? You know, you can only play for a certain amount of hours. <laughs> um, but, you know, even now, songs like Chasing Rainbows and Getting Better and Going for Gold and On Standby and Bully Boy and Disco Down, all these all these old hits by us, it doesn't matter if it's 1994 or 2024 because the reaction is just as strong wherever we go and wherever we play. It's just an amazing thing. So the fact that we now have new songs that perhaps people need a little bit of time to get used to, they're just slotting into the set so well. It's not like they're sticking out like sore thumbs because they're new and we're a lot older. It's still very Shed 7, but it just sounds fresh and, and relevant. I think the important thing I'm feeling at the minute and what I'm getting excited about is we're relevant. We're back, we're new, mm. we've got new product out there. I think it's some of the best things we've ever written. Um, and it just paves the way for our future. You know, we are we will become the new Rolling Stones, Robin, believe you me. <laughs> what, <laughs> what I find very interesting, uh, and that this, this is... Is is there a song that you've written either uh, on the uh, older albums or on the newer albums uh, that you think deserves more attention? Because I always like that the way the, the artist sees it themselves. Obviously, you have the singles and the hits and the, the songs that do well. But is there one in your catalog uh, 
and it can be from the new album if you wish, but uh, that that you feel deserves attention. Well, we've always been classed as a bit of an underdog, um, mm. and our hardcore fan base always say, you know, we're very undervalued, um, and we deserve more recognition. To be fair. I think a little bit of the reason why we are that means that we're still here. You know, I think if we'd have had too much success, we might have crashed and burned. So I think I think always striving for more has kept us hungry and it's kept us fresh. But yes, obviously, we've released a lot of songs over the years and some of them do perhaps deserve a little bit more recognition. We, we had a song off our last album called Better Days that I think was, at the time, was one of the best things we've written. Um, there's a song off the new album called Starlings, which I think you can only write at a certain point in your life. You need a little bit of experience in life to be able to write a song like that. But for me, that particular song, it's all about, and as morbid as this might sound, it's about wanting to die to be with the love of your life that's recently died. And that is a universal thing. Sure. Lots of people will experience those kind of feelings when they get a little bit older. So, you know, I want to hit the heartstrings. And, you know, I'm hoping that some of these songs do take on a life of their own. And I don't really care if it takes another 20 years for that to happen. Mm. I just think it will at some point, you know. Um, and there's another song off the new album called Throwaways with Peter Doherty on there out of the Libertines. And it's a kind, it's a little bit autobiographical in a sense because we've always felt a little bit like outsiders. You know, when mm -hmm. Britpop was at its height, it was always Blur, Oasis, Pulp. We were never really included in the Britpop celebration side of it. We were more classed when Britpop was starting to fade a little bit. Uh, we started to be included in Britpop as one of the bands that were in the lower leagues, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, we were never Premier League. <laughs> So, you know, again, I think that's that spurs us on, that makes us hungry for more. And, and it, it is incredible how a lot of the things from the 90s that don't exist anymore were the ones that really used to have a go at us. And they've long disappeared. And here we are still doing it. So, you know, I think a, a bit of that comes through on this new album. I think you can hear things like that in it. Or maybe I'm overthinking. No, I, I, I think uh, that's that's very fair to say. Like you have a chip on your shoulder to still. I don't know if it's uh, it's the desire to prove uh, people wrong, but it's it's kind of a showing people look look we're still here we we're still doing it we still have the passion yep. we still make good music. Yeah, exactly that, and we've never changed our mentality. We've always been the same. We've always approached what we do the same. It's just only now, again, I think with age that we can look back and go, right, well, we're still here. We still love what we're doing. You know, as I said about the Rolling Stones, incredible, really, incredible that they're in their 80s and they're still releasing new music and they're still fit enough to get on a stage and do big tours. You know, And I do, I, I was kind of half-joking saying we will become the new Rolling Stones, but in another way, you know, whenever we play now, more and more over the past maybe 10 15 years i've noticed this more and more there's people coming from our generation to see us play and they want to reminisce and they want to get babysitters and they want to come out and have an ace night and reminisce about chasing rainbows and what they were doing when it came out hmm. but more and more of these people are bringing their 8 10 12 year old children with them and the 10 10 year old children aren't looking like they've been dragged along they're all singing every word so yeah. they're obviously they've obviously been listening to their parents' music at home. So I, you know, I'd be the first if there's a five six year old kid at the front of the at, at the front of the barrier, I'll make a big point of introducing them to the rest of the crowd and telling everyone there's a six year old here. He's called Robin. You know, he's here. You know, mm. and everyone the crowd love that. It just makes everyone embrace and 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 that kid will come back and he'll keep coming back. So. When Robin turns 35 and I'm 95, God willing, I'll be there doing it for him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you raise an interesting point, and especially with the Rolling Stones, because, I mean, they're in their 80s and they're still pretty much the biggest band around. Um, mm. What does that say about the type of music that you make, that the Rolling Stones make, that makes it timeless in a way, that doesn't, like... Uh, 
Britpop to to some degree was in in a way at that time a flash in the pan. You had grunge in the uh, right before that, which was a period of four years, and then it disappeared. What makes certain music timeless and other types of music not? Well, I, I don't know. I think scenes are created certainly by the press. Scenes are mm. created, and it's a kind of handy catch-all thing to explain what this kind of music's like. But yeah, you're right. You know. Um, I mean, I guess you still get bands influenced by grunge. And and now, uh, certainly in the UK, I'm hearing a lot of young bands picking up guitars because of bands like Oasis in the 90s. The only difference being some of these bands take it one step too far and dress to alike and stand mm. still while they're singing. And, you know, there's one thing being a tribute kind of act and there's another thing having your own identity. And I think we've always had our own identity. Mm. We've never played ball. We've just always had our own sound and we've had ups and downs because of that, but we've stuck to our guns. So, you know, rock and roll will never die. It's like classical music will never die. You know, yeah. jazz will never die. The blues, it, it'll, it's timeless. It's just some bands have something a little bit unique about them and the capacity to want to continue to do it, you know. And and also, no, not go too much up their own arses and believe their own hype. You know, we've never really been a big fan of bigging ourselves up massively to the point where there's only one way and that's down, you know. Sure. So, you know, I'm not saying we've invented the wheel. I'm not saying we do anything any different to a lot of other bands, but we have our own unique sound. I guess it's my foghorn voice uh, and the melodies that come out and Paul's amazing guitar skills, it just kind of sits well together. And we're very lucky, as I say, we've known each other since we were 11. There's not many bands that have that kind of history. You know, as I say, spending the first two years of our lives as boys together and just loving music. Uh, I mean, it's a bit sad, really, in this day and age. You don't get many young kids who are massively into music anymore. It takes them a lot longer to get into it. And to see, you know, my, my dad used to drive us to rehearsals when we were like 13 and 14 and Paul's dad would take us home again at the end of it. Just all really great, good, young, youthful, energetic mm. and wanting to create, you know, and show off. We're just massive show offs at the end of the day. And if I can, if I can be here in 30 years time still showing off, then jobs are good at that's amazing to hear. Now, I do want to quickly get into throwaways because uh, you mentioned throwaways and uh, Pete Dorothy uh, is on the song as well. What was the initial idea for that song and how did Pete end up uh, in the conversation? So as part of the writing process, um, Paul would usually send me a guitar idea and I would start thinking about the melodies and then we'd get together and bash it into some type of shape. But weirdly with throwaways, I had this melody going around my head um, and the words just came, the, the chorus words just came pretty much straight away while I was humming this melody. So I had this throwaways written off the page, throwaways running with the strays. I just kept pacing around my house singing that over and over. So I showed that to Paul and he kind of worked out the chords underneath it and we created that. At the time, we weren't really considering anyone being on it, um, but we, we happened to play a festival in the UK called the Bingley Festival in 2022 in the summer uh, and the Libertines were headlining it. So we mm. were playing just before the Libertines. So as we were doing our hour-long set, I'm on stage and I kept looking over to the stage right where my family was stood watching. And there's Peter Docky stood with my family singing every word of all of our songs. And I'm thinking, all oh, right, okay, right. So I've never met him before. So I thought, that's interesting. He, he knows who Shed Seven are and obviously he quite likes us because he's singing along. So after the gig, uh, I approached him and introduced myself and I just said, are you a fan of Shed Seven? And he said, oh, yeah, I used to, as a boy, I used to sit in my bedroom learning Shed Seven songs on my guitar. So I just thought, right, okay, so let's take this one step further. How would you like to be part of our new album? Would you like to <laughs> guest on it? And he just said immediately, he just went, I'd love to. And this is without even hearing the song that we, we were going to give him, you know. So um, I just thought Throwaways was a perfect choice because, right. as I say, you know, lyrically, 
it's about being outsiders at the end of the day. But then at the same time, it's like we don't give a fuck. We're, we're yeah, outside. But... We don't care. So sorry to interrupt, but that's exactly what I kind of uh, wrote down from that song. We won't change our ways, even if that means we're thrown away. So, so yeah. it's it's kind of accepting who you are and not trying to to change who you are for the sake of other people. And I really like that sentiment. Yeah, exactly. That's what it's all about. And again, I think that comes with age because we've we've spent a long time in our career trying to. <laughs> trying to explain ourselves, you know, mm. and, and, and not really being part of the, the big event, you know. Um, I mean, when Britpop started to happen, it was all London-based, and we, we live in a city called York that's right in the sure. north of England. So, yeah, and we didn't play ball. We didn't move to London, which is what you were supposed to do. So we always felt a little bit on the outside. And I believe the Libertines probably had a little bit of that too, you right. know, with all of their troubles and tribulations that they went through. I believe that they probably were a little bit on the outside. So for me, lyrically, it was the perfect song for me to ask Pete to join in on because it means something. It's not You're not just singing words. It actually means something. So I think what we should do, we should make a video to that song. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's, nobody's heard that song yet because it's not been released as a single or anything as yet. Um, but I think we should do a, a video for it. And I think the ideal video would be for me and Pete to be wearing really big coats in winter on some moorland where it's really cold, just walking across the moors going, throwaways, you know. So the plan for the video is already there. That's excellent. Um, in there, in there, we need to make it into something, yeah. But am I right in saying you also already have some uh, shows planned or, or have they already happened where Pete will uh, be on stage with you? Uh, no, they, they're happening next summer. So yeah. because it's our 30th anniversary year, we've got lots of different things planned. Um, I mean, for me, it's amazing how the very first week of our 30th anniversary year, we're releasing a brand new set of songs. So that kind of sets up the rest of the year amazingly for us. Uh, so we, we put two gigs in our hometown, and because we don't play York that often because it's our hometown and the pressure's mm. on. Um, so we put two gigs on in in the middle of the city. In this, in the, uh, the It's called the Museum Gardens. It's a really picturesque gardens with some old church ruins and stuff. Really lovely place. Right. And it's a very unusual place for bands to play. It hardly ever happens. So <clears throat> for us to do that in our hometown, so <clears throat> excuse me, it sold out within about two hours. Uh, over two nights which is amazing uh, so we asked Peter if he'd like to come and support us so seeing as he's going to be there supporting us um, <clears throat> hopefully he'll come out and sing throwaways with us that would be the icing on the cake yeah and I mean the way, the way you speak about it and you mentioned it earlier in the interview it, it feels like the best uh, the band is in the best place uh, it's ever been and that's really awesome to hear after all this time so uh, very well done <laughs> Well, thank you, Robin. We need to come over to the Netherlands and do some gigs. It's been an awful long time. Well, yeah, if, you, if you're in Amsterdam, I, I'll, I'll definitely uh, swing by if I can. Uh, well, we're, listen, lu we're lucky to have you. Well, that would be absolutely amazing. I think me and uh, Paul went and did uh, some type of acoustic gig there um, as part of that Shine On event a while ago. But it'd be mm. lovely to come back as a full band. And here's a deal. If we do do that, you come down. And I'll buy you a beer and then you buy me a beer, yeah? Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Great stuff.